We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So tonight's question comes from Roger Malosh, Patreon patron, local Windsor gamer, and longtime fan of the show, as well as indie game designer that you can find at rogerdodgergames.com. That's R-O-G-E-R-D-O-G-E-R, games.com. Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean, I enjoy your show and look forward to my weekly dose of game talk. I have a question about game pace. A little while ago, I was playing a complex five-player game which seemed to drag on forever. I would plan my latest move, and wait, and wait, and wait. By the time my turn finally came around, I had forgotten my original plan. (laughs) I would quickly come up with something, then execute my turn because I didn't want to slow the game down even more. Unfortunately, this was usually far from an optimal play, and I ended up trailing behind everybody. On the flip side, I tend to do poorly in real-time games because I need a little time to plan my moves, and this just doesn't happen in real-time games. Mm. I'm a bit like Goldilocks when it comes to game pace. Not too fast, not too slow, but just the right pace for me to make those optimal plays. What kind of game pace do you generally prefer? Also, can you discuss a few examples of very fast or very slow-paced games? Well, thanks, Roger, for tonight's topic, and even better for being in the chat room to hear us discuss this. Uh, I would love to hear when we get to preferred pacing, uh, your thoughts and what games you prefer, and I'll ta- call that out on the show as well. Now, I do feel a little bad, um, as I know exactly what game he's talking about with that complex five-player game, uh, which I know he played at one of our Barbershop Bar events and went on a little longer than expected. Now, Roger has some specific questions, which we will get to. But first, I want to talk a bit about board game pacing in general, and more importantly, give you some ideas on what you can do as players to affect that pacing, hopefully to make the game more enjoyable for everyone at the table. Now, we've hit on many of these ideas and tips, mentioning them in other shows, but never actually addressed the topic directly. So that's what we're hoping to do tonight. Now, one interesting thing that hit me when working on this topic, and it was one of those I've written paragraphs of text and done research and written all this stuff, and then I had come up with the episode title, and I had just put long games and short games, and then I realized this isn't about game length at all. Game length and pacing are two completely different things. You can play a very long game, even an 18-hour game, that moves along at a nice pace, And you can play a short 15-minute game that still manages to drag on turn after turn. Now, unfortunately, there's no easy way to know which sort of way the pacing will go without experience. Though usually you can bet that your first playthrough is going to be at a slower pace. Yeah, when you're learning the game, that is going to be a slower-paced game just by default. So my first thing I want to talk about in regards to board game pacing is the thing we talk about a lot in our show, and that is setting expectations before the game starts. Now, we say this a lot on our show. This is probably the number one piece of advice we give every gamer, and it's it, honestly, it's the number one fix So for so many game night problems. Before starting to play a game, you should make sure everyone about to play is on the same pace And this is in regards to both the pace and the game length. If this is a super long game, they should know. If there's lots of downtime and thinking, the player should know. If there is a large turnaround between player turns, let people know. If you let people know, you know what? This is one of those games where everyone's going to be planning a lot. And it's perfectly fine if you get up from the table and, you know, go grab a drink or go to the washroom between your turns because it's one of those games. Or the opposite. You know what? This is a game that requires a lot of focus. We're on a time limit. I need everyone to pay attention. I need you to take your turns quickly. This is going to be a real time game. And, you know, if your phone, put your phones on on silent for a minute. Or, you know, if you need the washroom, go use it now before we start. Yeah. And along with that, uh, you should have expectations about um, sort of what, uh, what, how it, how it normally plays versus, you know, if this is your first time, Mm -hmm. how it's going. Uh, again, expectations, setting expectations. And if it's the first time for everybody, that should be clear as well, because maybe yes. everyone doesn't know. And you mo- at that point, you have to be ready to say, well, we've got three hours. I think we can get this in, but it is a first mm-hmm. game teach. Is everyone going to be okay if we don't finish mm-hmm. or staying later if we do want to try and finish? Yeah, and remember also, to, just to kind of hint back to the other thing is this should be part of a bigger conversation, right? 
as Sean said, is a learning game, but you should also be discussing how competitive it is. Hey, this is a learning game. No one take this too seriously. Play around to find out what's going on. Or you know what? We all know the rules. We've all played before. I want to see who's going to win this. Let's take this seriously. Heck, let's put some money on the table. Those are two very different styles to sit down and play that are both going to affect your pacing. So that should be part of the overall conversation, as well as bringing up any potential problematic content in the game and other things we've talked about on past shows. Now, one example I want to bring up that's specifically related to board game pacing that is meant to be discussed before the game is a game I don't actually own, but I have played, and that is Five Tribes. This is a game where you put out a, a grid of tiles and you put a bunch of meeple on them and you play Moncala. You pick up all the pe meeple from one square and then drop them one at a time in other spots and then score. The problem with the game is there's so many meeple out there and so many squares and possible combinations that no one could figure out all the math for every possible play. But there are players out there that will try and try their hardest. The rule book even says you may need to limit the times on some players. Don't think about it too much. One or two points isn't going to win or lose you the game. Just find a move that looks good and do it. When the rule book has to warn you, you know there's a potential pacing issue in that game. Yeah, that's 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 tough. And, and but it's important, and that's why it's in the rule book, is because it's a discussion that needs to be had. Yeah. Similarly, with other discussions, as we're talking about this, you know, big picture discussion in advance, if like Roger, you like to take a little time to find that better move, let people know. Yeah. You know, if if you if you kind of just go with the flow, I I personally tend to sort of, you know, whatever the game's is I'm probably just going to go along and you know if people are taking a little longer I might I might be willing to take a little longer but if things are rushing I'll just pick a move I'm not that competitive so I'm I'm pretty easy going when it comes to timing but if you aren't and you know that you aren't make a note of it let people let people be yep. aware and help that let them that help them make decisions about the game going forward yep. Now the other thing you do have to watch when you're talking about pacing the game is are you in some form of time limit is it just an open game night at your house that starts at six and you play till whenever? You probably don't have to worry about it. But are you going to try to get in a game of Catan in one hour? You want to do it on your lunch break? That can work. I can easily finish a game of Catan in an hour as long as everyone else is on the page trying to play quickly and make quick moves and focus. If everyone knows how to do it, you can get done in no time. Now, are you if you're at a public play event or even your home game night, do you want to play one game all night? That's it. You're going to sit down. You're going to focus. You're going to take your time. You're going to really deep dive this game or do you want to try to fit in three, four games so you have more of an experience? All of that should be talked about before picking which game to play and then pick games that fit that. Yeah, absolutely. Timing is so important because it's really easy to just sit down and, oh, we're going to play a game tonight. And I'm, you know, let's take the evil example of Monopoly. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, six hours later, people are still bouncing back and forth the last few thousand dollars and it never apparently is going to end yes. um if, if you'd had that discussion up front uh perhaps even discuss which or which uh which host rules you are or mm -hmm. aren't going to use you might have headed that all off at the pass and had a solid game night or known that you were going to play until four o'clock in the morning when somebody yep. finally threw down their money and left so I think what we'll do next is let's talk a bit about the main factors that affect game length. Basically, what makes a game long game long and a short game short, um, which is also going to affect pacing in that case, because the these things affect the overall length because of the different pace they give. And one of the biggest impacts that I've now witnessed um, over many, many gameplays on pacing is how many players are playing. That seems to be the biggest factor for both how quick the game plays and how fast it plays at the table time between turns and all of that. The more people, the longer it's going to take. It just it's a given you unless the game does something to limit it, which I props to Valeria Card Kingdoms for recognizing this as a problem in their core game where when you play with five players, the fifth player doesn't do a thing. And I honestly, I stopped my head. I forget what it is. But when you have five players, the fifth player skips a thing and then that rotates so that you don't have a full player turn as the fifth player every time it goes around the table. Like next time you're not the fifth player. So it's everyone still gets an equal number of turns. But they realized waiting for someone to buy and go and, and, and fight bad guys and capture keeps just takes too long. And they didn't want the count that high. 
So I think player count is one of the biggest ones. And if you are interested in a more long drawn out experience, play games with more people. And if you want a quick game, play games with less people. And along with that, you get into the interaction of players. So mm -hmm. games with high player interaction are often going to take longer, the more players you add, as opposed to certain uh, multiplayer solve share games where the acts of another person aren't going to affect your turn. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to pre-plan and know that little, if anything, is going to get completely destroyed by the actions of other players. Yes. Uh, so that, that interaction level within the player count uh, sort of scales how the player to count uh, the player count makes things worse or better. And then the next thing is how much stuff do you have to do on your turn? The, the turn time. And I'm not talking about AP. We'll get to that. AP is <laughs> definitely it. Sean's already mentioned it a bit, but, but just the amount of stuff you have to do, like the amount of things you have to choose from the amount of actions you take. Do you take three actions out of a list of eight? Do you have to roll the dice, then move a piece, then take an action, then draw a card, then react to that card, then do something else. Or do you just roll a bunch of meeple as quick as possible and stop when you're done? Like those are all different pacing that is going to be different based on the turn time. And again, some games have all of those pacings at the same, or all of them ability to do all of those things. If you look at a game like um, uh, Tapestry, sometimes a game, sometimes a turn can be really quick. Sometimes yep. you're making a move on the map and you're taking this and, and, you know, all of a sudden your turn is three times longer than your last turn simply yes. because of the action track you decided to move on that turn. Yeah, engine builders are, I don't know if you call it a good or bad for that, because they tend to start off with a slow pace because you don't have a lot of options, you don't have a lot of things to do, whereas later in the game you're setting off all these chain reactions and it takes forever to finish your turn. Now, of course, there's also the round time, which, yeah, is the total turn time, but the problem is there's upkeep usually. There's usually more that happens either at, like at the start or end of a turn, some kind of upkeep that happens, or the start or end of a round. Games that I find are bad for this, that I don't enjoy, are games where you have to reseed a board, where you have to clear stuff and put new stuff up. A great example of this is Castles of Burgundy. I love playing that game on Board Game Arena, and I almost hate playing it in person, having to pull out all the tiles. And then, of course, there's a the whole problem where the tiles don't tell you what they do, and I don't have a tooltip like I do online, but that's, that's unrelated. I just hate the time wasted clearing the board, pulling out new little chits and putting them onto the proper spots and then possibly forgetting that one of the spots is only changes every other round. Just it's fiddly. Whereas uh, on the opposite side, a game that actually has a really quick and efficient end game is this new game that we uh, released a little early, Castlands of Valeria. Uh, yeah. There's a scoring round at the end of every single round. And the first time you do it, it's a little tricky, but... Yeah. Uh, as you've done it, my third time when we just played on the weekend and it was really fast. There were two of us doing it, uh, you know, one person who was marking the score and I would sit there, point at the section we were looking at going, all right, you won first, you get this many points. You won second, you get this many points. We tied for third, split the points and yep. move through and really, really quick and efficient as opposed to trying to reset things. And then Sean mentioned the thinking time of what the other players did. And I kind of broaden this out to just in general, how much does the board state change between turns and rounds? Now, yeah, in most cases, this is going to be the actions of the other players, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's something where you draw a random event or things on the board move or, or um, I, I'm like, you think of like potion explosion. It's what the other players do because they're taking a marble, but like they're not planning. They're not, they're not strategically doing something that messes with your turn but the state of the board or what you're interacting with changes. And this is one of the biggest factors for pacing, not necessarily game length, but pacing. Can you plan out your move or will things change too much in between before you actually get to ask? Now, I know this was an issue on one of the, one of the issues why Rogers Gaming was talking about takes so long is that is a game where in general, you can kind of plan ahead. But if someone takes your action or takes your thing or does the thing you want to do, you basically have to redo everything, and that could be the player just before you. Yeah, absolutely. This is something you, you really have to watch for or be aware of, not necessarily watch for. It's a perfectly acceptable part of yes. a game, but you need to know whether that's going to happen. Uh, another option is in deck builders. Sometimes, you know, the, when, when the villain goes, and you know, in a co-op deck builder, when the villain goes at the beginning of every turn or at the end of every turn, 
they could have a sort of their own triggering effects that could take mm. longer. All of a sudden, you know, you're a little later in the game and the villain's got more things they can do. So it's not just pull yeah. one card and, and do it. It's pull one card, but that triggers another card, which triggers another card, which triggers another mm -hmm. card. And so those those turns can get a little bit longer as that game goes on and, and you run closer to the, the lose condition. And then similar to this, though, I, I have it separated out because to me, the, it doesn't necessarily mean the board state changes, but just random elements. Anytime there's something there you can't plan for, it's going to require more tactical thinking. You're going to have to react instead of plan ahead. Every, an event that comes up every round, any game that uses dice. Is there like a neutral player character that's going to do something between the player's turns, which kind of, again, kind of goes with that cooperative deck builder thing. Um, even non-deck builders, like you mentioned that when I was thinking Sentinels of the Multiverse, where after every action, you know, there's there's the um, the event happens and then the, the villain goes and then all their henchmen go and all of that stuff going on before. I, a deck of cards is used like, oh, if the Joker came up, that means something happens different from anything else that you may not have expected. Or just as simple as you roll the dice every turn. You know, yeah. you, you can't plan for what those dice are, how those dice are going to come up. And you need to deal with it. And then I, and the other one, of course, is thinking time, which I think kind of comes from all of the above, right? It's everything we've already talked about is going to impact the player's thinking time. But this is also a factor of how quick do the players think. Some people are fast on their feet and quick to see things. Some people are better at spatial reasoning. Other people are better at st strategy and planning ahead. There is a huge factor in the the. Ability is the wrong word, but the, the skills of the players playing the game is going to impact your pacing greatly. Uh, there are certain gamers out there that I don't enjoy playing with because of the pace they like to play games. That does not match mine. Meanwhile, there's other people I'd love to play with because, man, they're like on the ball and they're like, boom, 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 boom. And they're still winning. And I'm like, it blows me away. It's awesome. And at the same time, the, the game you're playing can impact this. Now, some people yes. are going to take a long time no matter what. And that's those people and if they know that they should be mentioning that up front but sometimes because the game encourages longer uh play times and and you can come up with things in advance the, the board state isn't changing dramatically you've got other people's turns to make your decisions on unlike some games where it's you know it's a whole new board state when you get there and <laughs> good luck if they're a, if they're a heavy thinker they're going to they only have their turn to, to think. Yeah. So it's going to stretch on. Now, this is a, this is one that isn't about specific game, but another thing that's going to impact your game time, which isn't is your pace of your game night more than the pace of the game is your setup and takedown time. This has a big impact, especially if you're on a time limit when you've got that one hour Catan game. Don't forget, you've got to set up Catan. You've got to, depending on how well put away your game is, you might have to split up all the decks. You might have to divvy out all the player colors. You probably want to randomly generate the board, though I got to say, if you're on the one hour time limit, using the set board in the middle of the book is probably your best way to go for Catan. But that's just a little side tip on playing a quick game of Catan. But you're going to have to put the little chits out on everything, and you're going to have to place the robber on the desert. And then someone at the end of the game's got to put it away. And if you're literally on a time limit, like you've got to be back at your workstation. You, someone has to account for that time. Yeah, and this this goes to a lot of other shows we've talked about how to set up, a, uh, you know, how to pre, how to pack up your game, how to efficiently store things. There's a whole lot of different uh, episodes we've had talking about things that can impact this uh, this time limit on setting up and yeah. tearing down. So we're not going to go into all of that, but just be aware that it does play uh, play a part. And another th aspect is if you are having players set up their own pieces mm -hmm. can actually help them understand the game better and might help them make uh, decisions faster. Yep. If you know your game board set up because you've put all the pieces down on it, sometimes for some players that can really assist in gameplay speed. Now, another thing I want to mention too is game length can affect your pacing because if your game is long enough, you're going to want to take breaks. And it, depending on the content of your game, you may want to take breaks if games are intense. A uh, ex odd example of this, at the barbershop bar on the weekend, there was a group I taught Gokuku who needed a break after the game 
because they were just so into it and so intense and they were like literally sweating playing this game because they had never played anything that was that tense and like oh my god it's gonna drop that they're like no no we we need a 15 minute breather here we're all gonna get a drink and yeah you can come back and show us something else in a bit but we need to like chill and and uh, another example like you're playing a game of twilight imperium allow time for bathroom breaks maybe you want to have a dinner break in there somewhere or someone's going to go run and go grab tim's that is also going to affect the pace of the game now not every round that's going to come up but you might want to set it that you know once we're two hours in we're going to take a 15 minute break all right well we know some of the things that are built into a game that can impact that uh, speed and pacing but what can you do as a player now, the ones I came up with were basically for games that were going long, but some of these will also apply to quick games as well. But in general, it's hard to affect a quick, short game. There's not a lot you can do. It's a quick, short game. But it's longer games you could do more. And of course, the most important, and we always encourage everyone to do this. I can't believe there was actually a thread on Twitter the other day where someone refuses to do that and thinks it's, it's terrible, which I was just like, man, you shouldn't be playing hobby games, is plan your move on other players' turns. Now, I know it's not always possible, and as Roger mentioned, it can be hard if downtime's too long and you can forget your plan. Um, I know I've had that problem many, many times where I, I back when we were playing Catan more regularly, and now I will admit there was alcohol involved, I used to have a thing where I would stick a card in my glasses so I remember to use the damn thing, and then my turn would go around the board twice, and I'd be like, what's this card? Oh, shoot, that's what I was supposed to do. At least have some plan in mind. I don't think I've ever played a game where it's so random that I couldn't plan something unless you're getting into like super party games like King of Tokyo. I can't really plan ahead. That is a game where I have to wait till the dice are in front of me. Look at the board state, roll the dice and make a decision. But most games I play, there's at least something I can plan ahead. Yeah, like, you know, can't stop Can't really plan the head on uh, during on no. can't stop. But that's, you know, that's one of the few. Even in that, seen. though, it could be like you're waiting for certain numbers. And if those come up, you know exactly what you're going to do. That's why, like, there's always seems like there's something. Yeah, I mean, even you plan ahead. Yahtzee, you can have a goal. You know, you're aiming yeah. for the you're aiming for the long straight today. You right. Know, you're like, oh, time. I didn't yeah. get that. OK, now I got to think. Yeah. Definitely. So planning your moves is huge. That is a big one. <laughs> uh, next, even if you can't plan your move, do pay attention when it's not your turn. So you're not starting to think about what to do when it's your turn. Even highly random games, seeing what other people are doing should affect your plans. I'm going to jump back to King of Tokyo since that, that's, that might be my recurring theme here is I at least I don't have to look and go, OK, who's in Tokyo? OK, who's out? OK, who has the most points? Don't be that person, please. You're just going to slow down everything for everyone. Yes, if this person's a new gamer and they're just learning the game, answer their questions. But in general, at least pay attention to what's going on. Plus, it's just polite. It's a it's social contract. It's the thing to do. You're all there to play a game. Pay attention to the game, even if it's a social event. Put the phone down. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh... Next, be aware when it is your turn. If more than once you're told, hey, it's your turn to go, you're part of the problem. We get it. Now and then you get distracted, right? You had to go to the washroom. That's totally excusable. You're on your phone now and then. You know what? I don't make people put phones away. I, there, there's way too much going on in the world. People they need to pay attention to things. They're working. They might get important announcements. Whatever. I don't mind. As long as when it's your turn, you're ready to go. I don't care what you do. But if it comes up twice that you weren't looking at the table, you weren't looking at this, I'm like, hey, Sean, it's your turn. Then it's a problem. Yeah, I find one of the problems I I've, I freely admit I, I've had it many times is certain games uh, because of the different kinds of play that there can be you're expecting someone to do something and you're waiting for them to do it and they've done something completely different that you totally missed so you yeah. have no idea it's your turn that sort of things happens it, it uh, happens. but i mean you know pay attention if no one's doing anything ask if someone has gone yeah. maybe you admit that you've but you've possibly missed something and and ask uh don't just sit around until someone says hey it's your turn yeah and i gotta say i don't know how many times that if there's a meme out there there's got to be where the person goes, whose turn is it? It's their turn. Like, like there's, there's usually about a 75% chance <laughs> if someone asks, whose turn is it? It's theirs. Yep. yep. Now, another thing, if you are playing a learning game or you're playing a casual game or you're on a time limit, don't spend as much time thinking. Yes, some players want to plan out every move, but that's not always the most appropriate way to play. 
this goes back to the discussion before game. If this is you and you know it's you, don't agree to play a casual game. Don't want to play like, hey, we're just playing a learning game. We're playing to fire play who finds out. Don't be that player who's going to take 10 minutes on the turn to squeeze one more point out or, or be the one that's like, well, I'm going to gain three points, but they're going to lose two, which gives a spread of five, which isn't quite. You're playing a casual game, play a casual game. Yes, there is a place for that other style of game, which should be discussed before the game starts and be like, all right, we're going to take this one seriously. Let's see who's the better player. Let's go. Totally legit. That's part of that discussion before game. If you, especially a learning game or casual game, don't take learning games seriously. Like that should, should be a rule that everyone should do. You're learning the game. Your first play is a learning game. I don't care how many videos you watched, how many times you read the rule book. Maybe if you've done a demo, you might have that little edge, but it's a learning game and everyone should treat it as such. And similarly, if you are teaching people and you've played the game many times, don't be the jerk who's just stomping all over. You don't have to throw the, get, throw the game, but at the same time, you don't have to put all your effort into making sure that yes. they pay because they don't know the optimal, optimal play solutions yet. I, which, which goes good with my next point, and this is something everyone can do, is ask slower players or players who look lost or who are taking a long time if they want help. I often do this when teaching a game. Note the important part here, though, is ask. Do not give unsolicited advice. Ask if they want help. I'll offer players options what they can do. I don't tell people how to play. I just point out maybe you haven't seen this yet. Sean, I think the best example of teaching Sean a game where he saw that was Lost Ruins of Arnak, where he's like, I pass. And I'm like, okay, I just want to point out, if you're aware, you could spend this token to do this, to go up here, to go up here, to do this and do this, and then get that card, and that card will let you do that. So, you know, your turn doesn't have to be over, but if you want to pass, you can, right? Um, now, I'm not saying tell people how to play either. Just present the options so they're obvious to them. So players have all of their choices in front of them. Then as important as asking, make, let them make the decision. Let that player decide what to do with the information you gave them. Yeah. And again, while we've talked a lot about what happens at the start of the game, discussing things in advance, make, getting everyone on the same page. It doesn't have to end there. During the game, there's no reason you can't say, hey, yeah. you know, we're, we're kind of, we're, things are, things are slowing to a crawl here. We've got a time limit. You know, the bar closes. Uh, we yep. have to be back at work. Let's um, maybe we should probably try and do this. Otherwise, we're going to have to cut the game off short. How do you guys want to finish this? Because it looks like we mm -hmm. might not make it through at this, at this pace. Now, that also applies to sh quicker games as well, right? Like, if, if you are having a problem and, and you need to, it, it applies to both. Like, like, the communication goes both ways. If you are having a problem, let people know. Now, if you're playing a long game, you're like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm lost. Someone did something there, totally threw me off my game. I need to completely rethink my whole strategy. Uh, do you mind giving me a few minutes? That's perfectly fine to ask. I don't know why, why, I don't think it's gamers. I think it's people are so scared to talk to each other. Just communicate. Now, with a slow, slower game or a fast game, like fast paced game, you're like, hey, can we slow down a bit? I'm losing track of things. Or, or, hey, can we take a short break? Like, I need to refocus. This is, or, you know what? This is getting a little too intense with, uh, with real time games, especially. Is, you know, at the end of this round, can we take five minutes just to kind of let tensions and adrenaline kind of, kind of wean off a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. Again, there's nothing. Uh, safety doesn't end at the RPG table. It works at the board yep. game table, too. And if you're getting overwhelmed, you've got a perfectly good reason to say, hold on, guys, this is too much. Yeah, no one should be thinking any less of you. Uh, and everyone else should have the feel the freedom to do that as well. And even then, it doesn't even have to be a safety issue. It just could be like, you know what? I'm a little overwhelmed. Like, you don't have to be having a full on panic attack to stop a game. You can just say, you know what? I need a little more time to think. I, I, the, the pace of this game is a little more than I intended. Well, to me, it's a safety issue because it's, you want to get to it before it becomes the panic attack. Yeah, true. Stop it, you know, stop it early. Stop, stop it when you see things escalating Yep. because you don't want to have a full on panic attack during a game. It, it's this is a game. That's yeah. Now, another thing you can do is adjust the player count. Um, I know adjust, you can't really do it in the middle of a game. In some cases you can. But the, the important thing to learn here, and, and I, I don't know, people seem to miss this. You don't have to play every board game at the highest player count possible listed on the box. 
people seem to think, oh, it's a five, two to five player game. That means it's a five player game. It's a two to six player game. Well, that means it's a six player game. No, just because it says it works at five doesn't necessarily mean at all that it's best at five. Now, okay. the game <laughs> Roger was not. hinting. Yeah, yeah. Now, the game Roger was hinting at, we actually find best at three or four. Four's okay, but way too long at five. We generally choose not to play at five. Well, I get that at a public play event, you want to get as many people involved in as many games as possible. Sometimes it's worth saying, you know, this will play five, but it's going to get long. So I need to make sure everyone's on board knowing it's going to take a long time to get around to your turn. And I fully understand if you want to get up and go do something else when it's not your turn. But please come back, you know, don't come back when it's your turn. Come back like when you notice the player before it seems to be acting so you can kind of catch up. Yeah, another good example is... Uh, and another valeria game dice kingdoms of valeria you know we were told by the designer hey yeah you know what it'll play five and they're right the game plays at five but yeah. it stretches on and it wears out its welcome at five unfortunately uh there's a reason why they the publisher put it at four uh because it's a more enjoyable experience with yeah. that one less player no nope, totally agree and then the thing we've said a million times in the podcast so as far as i know no one ever listens to because i've never seen anyone else do it is remember, you don't have to finish every game you start. If things are going too long and everyone looks bored, it's okay to say, hey, is everyone still having fun? Because if we're not, we can end it. You can end the game at a shorter point total. Again, you want that eight-hour game of Catan. I'm going to come back to these same, same ones. You want an eight-hour game of Catan, or an eight-hour game of Catan, sorry, a <laughs> one-hour game of Catan, play to eight points. That's where the eight comes from. Play to eight, don't play to ten. You want an eight-hour game of Catan? Go somewhere else. <laughs> oh, it's some people seem to take that long to play because it's usually because people are refusing to trade with each other. Which make trades, just make sure they're to your advantage and the opponent. Make sure each getting a, a equal share. Catan without trading is not fun. But anyway, um, like end the game shorter too. Like like just play one more round. Like at the game. Um, we'll, we'll go to Cast Ones of Valeria. It, it is a five-round game. And that one's a little hard to cut part way through. You want to cut out two rounds if you do that one because of the way the scoring works where you score different districts. So every district scores three times. You want to do it so every district scores twice. So you don't want to cut out the last round, but you might want to cut out the middle two so that everything scores an equal amount. But there's no reason not to do that. There's also a way to go. You know what? We're stopped. The, the bar closes at 10. At 950, we're going to stop. Whoever has the most points at 950 wins the game. And actually, cutting out the last one would be fine because you've still scored all the real, all everything twice. Yeah, I personally, I think the score everything is more important than the score each district. But, uh, but yeah, no, I I, I get that. But uh, yeah, no, definitely. And and one of the other things is if you're playing a co-op, if you can see that it's a loss, mm -hmm. don't play it out, and you don't have to drag it out to the very yep. end to know that the big baddie has wiped the table with you all completely many, many times. It's obvious that this is, this is a, a lost cause folks. Let's, you know, does anyone really want to try and try and, you know, that 1% chance that we can do this or should we just sort of wrap it yeah. up here? It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And similarly, even in a competitive game, if there's a runaway leader problem, or if you think there's no way you can win, you can offer to concede. Now, the trick is this is, again, part of communication and your table culture and your social contract. Ask. Don't just concede. Say, is it OK? Like, I, I, I'm done. This is I can't possibly win this. I want to back out. Now, in some games, you still need to be in. It's an area majority game or whatever. Whatever you do is going to impact the final end for the players who do want to finish. Then you need to get permission to do this. Don't just walk away. Um, but there's no reason to, to to not have like have the conversation again. It's it's all about communication. You sit there and you go, you know what? There is no chance I can keep up. I'm having no impact on this game. I'm going to go play something else or whatever. I'm going to go on my phone for a bit. This way, you're not going to get mad at me for not paying attention. <laughs> and I'll have permission to go do it over there and play some puzzle quest. And you guys finish up or the opposite. Like Sean's obviously won. Like no thing we can do in the next two turns can earn us the 62 points he's already got. None of us have the resource. Why don't we just call it Sean Wins? Like, there's no reason not to do that. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's jump back to a couple of the actual questions Roger asked. Right. Starting with, what kind of game pace do you generally prefer? 
All right, so I'm less Goldilocks than Roger, I will say. I, I like games with all kinds of pace. Now, I dig real-time, short time limit games. I, a couple examples are Fuse and Breakdancing Meeple, but I also love long event games like, say, your Twilight Imperiums. What I don't like are games with too many options that lead to AP when playing with those players who have to figure out every option. Now, I'm going to go back to the start of the conversation. Look at this full circle, Ouroboros here. We're going to go back to Five Tribes. I did not like that game at all the first time I played it because I played with a player that did want to figure out every possible option to find the one that got them one more point, and it was a terrible experience. Now, another example, though, is playing Indonesia with a heavy ward gamer, where turns took forever because they were trying to get every little advantage and figure out just before they split the market on something how to get a couple extra dollars. And another one was playing Steam with a literal mathematician who was taking notes and doing calculations between turns. And it'd be like, no, no, hold on. I still have two more goods to figure out the net value of. And we're like, OK, all right, go ahead. Figure out the net value. You know, you're winning. Like, just no matter which one you buy, you're still going to win. I don't like games with a lot of talking either as part of the turns. This is what Sean was talking about with the interaction between the players. I tend to avoid negotiation games, social deduction games, and games like that. Now, the perfect example of this one for being too long would be Diplomacy. This is a game where sometimes players take months to play with actual backroom dealings going on. But even in a quick afternoon game that I've witnessed, there's all kinds of, hey, come over here. Oh, come in the other room. Why don't we go to the bathroom together so we can make our, our thing before everyone writes down their moves and actually takes a turn. It can drag on forever. So all of these for me are actually, though, if you'll look at it, more about the people than the games. Most of these are fixed when having those initial discussions. Okay, we are going to play diplomacy, but we're going to limit negotiations to five minutes and we're going to set a timeline. Or we're going to play I did five tribes and we're not going to figure out every possible thing. If we have to, we'll set a time limit. The style of games I prefer not, there are styles of games I prefer not to play with certain styles of gamers. And I know that. So when invited to a game, if I realize that a mismatch is about to happen, I'll just turn down the play. While I enjoy most games at any pacing level, I would say the sweet spot for me is when it gets to a player's turn, they start taking their turn right away. They start doing actions ready, right away. They have the ability to plan ahead and then just have to enact their move on their turn where people do the thinking off turns between their turns. That same game can, of course, have a few surprise moments where players need a bit more time, right? That something changed. Oh, no, I have to think but about this. And to me, those are usually exciting, tense moments where the other players all watch to see how they react to it and how the board's going to change. Because up until then, we've just been kind of flowing. And then, oh, the shift, the shift happened, the twist. Now, what are they going to do? That's the type of game and pacing I enjoy. Yeah, I'm learning more and more that I prefer games sort of at the either end. Um, either quick, light, fair, not real time, but uh, card games where you just get into a game quickly playing, not all, uh, automatically, but close. Um, and you can have that chat all the way down to that bigger, meatier games, the the weather machines, the, you know, the, those big involved three plus, four plus uh, weight games that are gonna take more time, but everyone knows they're taking more time. Everyone is going mm -hmm. to be thinking because you've got a, you know, a, a wide range of options and you can only do two of the eight actions, even though you wanna do all of them. <laughs> yep. uh, it's those ones in the middle where you really can't chat, but it's really easy to overthink and get bogged down. Those are the ones that I struggle with. Now, Roger's other question was, can you discuss a few examples of very fast or very slow paced games? Why don't we go with three each? Okay. So as mentioned at the start of this, uh, again, remember game pace isn't the same as game length. So the first game I want to highlight is the game we reviewed last week, uh, Cast Ones of Valeria. This is a great example of a longer game that has a great pace. There is a lot going on. And there are a lot of different options and there's iconography and things you have to overcome to learn the game. But once you actually learn the game, 
each turn, your options are fairly limited. You're only going to take three options. You're either going to get a bonus or you're not. And doing each of the individual actions is fairly quick and simple. And most of the actions are basically the same thing. You are going to pay for something and put it on the map. Then get any bonus for doing that. That's pretty much what you do most turns in the game. There's some exceptions like shipping and going to the wharf and some of the placing things on map trigger other things. But like the basics are pay a resource, pay gold for how many of the thing are already on the board and put it out there and then wait for the scoring round to see if you win that area. Once everyone has the basics down, that game just flows really smoothly, I found. And it's one of those games where I don't realize how long I've been playing it. It feels like I've been playing for a half hour, 45 minutes. And I look and go, oh, geez, we've, we've been here. The, the, the coffee shop's closing. <laughs> All right. I guess we're only getting one game in today. Now, I'm going to go with a game that for me doesn't have great pacing, but is still yeah. a really fun game and a game we all like. This is Roll Camera. Now, in this case, it's because you've got a co-op game with a lot of decision points mm -hmm. and points of view on the best way forward. Turns can really slow down as because you're all trying to work out an optimal solution with what you've got. Mm -hmm. uh, you're rolling dice each turn, so there's a random aspect that is going to throw a wrench into any pre-planning you might do. There are communication limitations, so you can't even talk about all the things you might want to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then that interaction, unlike many Euro style games, really adds to that inconsistent turn length. Yeah. Uh, the B movie expansion added a huge amount of replayability, but it also added even more decision points with which to yeah. discuss. So, as much as we really enjoy Roll Camera, its pacing isn't ideal. And it's one you definitely want to have a talk about if you were going to play yeah. at, say, a public play event. Yeah, that one's that one's weird. The pacing and and I think the biggest thing is some turns are super quick. Like the pacing's like, I rolled the dice, I got what we needed. Boom, we film a film, we did a thing, let's put a new thing out. Awesome. High five, your turn. And, and then other turns and now are it's like, a 20 minute discussion because yeah, you just like, flipped oh, out. I, a I new could card. put out this set piece or I could use this die. Oh, don't forget you can hire an intern. Oh, that's right. I could hire an intern, but then we have a new problem. How are our pro like and and like both in the same game, it's oh, it's yeah. strange. Like it's a real roller coaster of yeah, pacing, yeah. Un uneven pacing. Is, I think the biggest uh, way to, to describe yeah. roll camera. No, I agree. Uh, my next example, I'm going to bring up Terraforming Mars. Now, not because I think the pacing in that game is perfect. Actually, I think it's actually a little slow. But I want to bring up the impact of one sp uh, the the impact of one ex expansion. And the impact it had on pacing in the game, because I think it's noteworthy. So when you first play Terraforming Mars, even long time fans of the game, people played it 50 times. You start off every game a little lost. You have a bunch of cards to choose from and a corporation to pick. And unless there's that very clear synergy between those cards, you have no idea what type of strategy to adopt. And it's really difficult to decide what cards to keep and which corporation to pick unless you already have like you played a bunch of games and you have a preferred play style then maybe there's some way to get you to go but especially with new players i hate teaching this game to new players because i'm handing them a beginner corp so at least it's one less decision and 10 cards and going go and they're just lost and of course they're lost and it's not a game where i can be like show me your cards so honestly whenever i teach this game i prefer to facilitate and i will help the new players as opposed to just letting them sink or swim yeah. Then you've gotten past that first decision point, right? Game starts. You're still stuck with a random deck. And especially if you're, if you've, either way you play, like I realize there's two different ways to play where you get random cards at the start of your turn or you draft both ways. Like you're like, oh, I got these five cards to draft from. They still don't go with anything I have. I don't know. I'm going to look at the board. I'll be like, eh, this game, I guess I'm going to go for, let's try to get lots of steel. I, I it just, Everyone else gets the same thing and everyone's trying to find a system, right? This is an engine builder. They want to start building their engine and, and it leads to a ton of downtime because players are presented with too many equally good seeming options and no clear direction on which way to go. So I will say the pacing in the early game of Terraforming Mars was terrible, like to the point that I refused to play the game without the expansion, which the chat room's already figured out what we're talking about, and that is the Prelude expansion. 
this expansion gives the game a kickstart. Nothing to do with Kickstarter. It, it, it gives you a kick in the butt. Oddly, by presenting you with more options. But these are options that clearly favor distinct strategies. They not only give you direction, a clear, I am going to take these prelude cards because they go with that corporation to give me a direction so that when I am drafting cards or getting my random cards and deciding what to keep, I can work towards a thing. But they also give you a starting engine and resources to run it a few times so the game pace gets going quicker. So there's no longer the, I can't afford to play anything. I've done almost nothing. Yeah, I put this up by one. You start having meaningful, engaging turns quicker. Like I am just amazed by how much Prelude fixed the pacing issue in Terraforming Mars. Now I know there are people out there that still hate it and that still find it too slow. And that's still, oh, well, it's right. The game turns and AP being too slow, the pace too slow and the game too long. I get it. I understand that the game's not for everyone even now. So a long game that I think does pacing right is Lost Ruins of Arnak. Now, I said the game did it right. That doesn't mean it isn't without pacing issues. The problem with Arnak, or at least some players in combination with Arnak, is the decision tree. Yeah. If you aren't as familiar with the game and what some of the optimum paths are, you can get lost in trying to work out the best pathway all the way down your decision tree towards your, your final outcome. And that way lies madness. There's a lot of <laughs> possibilities here. But if you pay close attention and spend the other player's turns working through your options, you should be more or less ready to go when it gets to be your turn. Mm -hmm. And there's very little player interaction to trip you up. Yes, someone yeah. might take your camping spot, but that's about it. Yeah, they might kill the monster you wanted to kill or take your spot. Though I got to say, losing the spot you needed can be devastating in that game. But going to those games that I like perfect pacing on, I think Arnak is one of those. Because it comes my turn, I'm ready to go unless that big twist happens that, oh, you totally cut me off. Okay, and that's where I say it's going to be a bit because everything I planned, you just ruined, which to me is part of the fun of the game, actually. Uh, now, because those were two long games, I wanted to go with a short game. I wanted to go with it with a short, quick, rapid fire, super low, um, low, low pace, low, slow pace, fast pace, not, not low pace, fast pace. Sorry, I'm like the opposite. Um, to me, that would be I, what I'm looking for in, in a short game. Because I don't really love party games. I don't love highly random games. Are games that give you player agency while still being quick. And these aren't easy to find. Most short games are random. And to be fair, I enjoy randomness in short games more because the games are over quick and I don't care that I lost due to random factors while so I'll play a game. Right? Party, push your luck style games. They're fine. I enjoy them. But what I want for a game when it is that when it's over in 15 minutes, I can look at the table and I can be like, I know what I would have done different. I know how I could have played better, or I can see what my opponent did to beat me. There, there is definite agency. What affected it was because of what other players do. So an example of this that we just discovered is Trick Draw. This is a super quick playing card game that's a race to 10 points. The rules are dead simple. Draw a card, play a card. When you play it, put it face up. Or sorry, put it face down. And it counts as one point out of 10. So you get 10 face down cards, you win or put it face up and use the ability on the card. Now, the real brilliance of the game comes from those abilities. They let you play more cards, draw more cards, flip over cards. Not even necessarily your cards. You can flip your opponent's cards over. Now, we've had a game that lasted less than five minutes and we've had our longest game under half an hour. And each time, while it may not have felt like I necessarily did something wrong, wrong and lost, I could always see there are things I could have done to play better. Yeah. Now, another true. example of this that may be more easily available, uh, Trick Cross just hitting the market now. Hey, new hotness on our show again, um, would be Stefan Feld's Revolution of 1828. And I'm pretty sure Sean will agree with me on that one for the pacing on the back and forth for a rapid fire game. That is a rewarding experience. Yeah, that one is literally just, you know, it, it's, it, it makes it look like a checkers game almost. You know, you're just, yep. you're just reaching down and clicking. Uh, for a short game with a quick pace that I like, Look no further than point salad. Mm. As long as you're watching the play and not with your hand in your phone, there's only nine cards to choose from. And only, at most, two of them will have changed from the last player. That's it. 
Yeah. Uh, there aren't going to be that many cards in your tableau. So your decision space is really limited. Uh, my goal, my thing with point salad, and I've been surprisingly successful with it is get your target early, you know, figure yep. out your goal cards early and, and don't Build just towards them. don't, don't kind of, you know, Oh, I'll figure out something as I go. Cause then you can kind of, kind of drag it out for everybody and you're, it, you're, it's not going to work. <laughs> No, I agree. Uh, point salad's a great one. The pace in that game, though, every now and then, again, players need to take a moment. Like, oh, hold on. The, the biggest thing I find in point salad, it's, it's more a matter of if you're not, because it, it can be a casual game where you're chatting and stuff like that. You might have to do the take a moment to look at whatever point cards everyone has. Whereas, yes, if you're all focused on the game, you probably are aware of that. But point salad's light enough and casual enough to me that, that really the only downtime in that game is if you weren't paying attention on what other players were doing until it although was I like it if D doesn't pay as much attention and doesn't yeah, notice that I, that I can score 12 points for every uh, pepper in front of me. Uh. So do we want to bring up anything from the chat before we get to a summary of what we talked about? So well, I think we've got a lot of uh, a lot of similar thoughts in there. Yes. Uh, some person is bringing up race for the galaxy is a great pace and I have to disagree. Um, I think at least in my experience, and maybe it's just me because I'm not the biggest race fan, I find race can lead to some real AP um, and that can can make for uneven pacing. Yes, if everyone is is super familiar with everything, mm -hmm. but uh, any, anyone who isn't at that upper level of race, you drop them in the game and all of a sudden you hit a real stall point as they yes. try to figure out what the heck it is they're supposed to do. Which what I want to do is I want to take that and add that to another factor that affects pace that we didn't talk about. So I appreciate that getting called out just so we can call out that we missed experience. The more you know a game, the quicker you'll be able to play that game. And system mastery is huge. Race for the Galaxy two-player is a fantastic quick game, as long as both people have played Race for the Galaxy two-player a number of times and generally know the composition of the cards. They know what's out there, what to expect. They they know what expansions are in play. They know the odds of going for a rebel versus trying to do an uplift and what's going to work. And it's great that way. But again, when playing with someone who doesn't have that experience, it can drag. Uh, tapestry is another one. And remember how long our first few games of Tapestry were compared to how quick we were firing through a game on Board Game Arena eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And Board Game Arena has come up several times uh, in the chat, uh, both for the ability to take time in a non real time yep. game, but there's also the ability to play real time and fire at, fire through it. And, you know, people who want to have too much AP are penalized for that. Yep. Um, that's definitely there. Yeah, Deanna, I noticed called out specifically, there are certain games she'd rather play on board game arena because she is one of those players who would like to spend more time planning but cuts herself short at the table so that everyone else is having a fun experience. She's doing the thing where she's just making a point, make a decision, right? Do something, even though she knows there might be a better move. Whereas in the right format, uh, board game arena being perfect for that, you can take as long as you want. Well, within some limitation, <laughs> but you could take hours before taking your turn. Yeah. And the same thing is also true. If you're taking about like, uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, we kind of mentioned it in, Passing a couple different ways is how seriously are you taking the game is going to impact the pacing. What I've always been absolutely fascinated by is the difference in game length. When we have a casual game night anywhere, could be at the local game store, could be at my house, could be anywhere, compared to when I run a great Canadian board game blitz. When we're running a blitz, the games are finished like lightning fast compared to playing at home. And it's all because of that focus, right? You're just playing. And when you were playing in a tournament for prizes, you are paying attention. You better be. <laughs> I assume you're going to be paying more attention and you're not chit-chatting and doing whatever and having fun and rolling the dice and laughing about the silly thing that happened. Instead, you're going, okay, that silly thing happened. That's not good. That's messing with my strategy. What do I do next? Uh, several people were talking a little bit about uh, when a game, you know, when your turn is done, uh, say something. Or if you're at a bar, knock on a table or something, just, you know, depending on the type of game, it may be appropriate to, you know, give some indication to the next person that you're done yep. and not just assume that they saw, saw you take your turn. Amusing anecdote related to that one. So we talked about last week, we got Kings in the Corner. And I think it's just from years of playing card games with my parents at the Knights of Columbus, uh, sometimes with strangers, 
when I finished my turn every time in that game, I knocked on the table. I don't do that when playing Terraforming Mars. Maybe I should, but just like it was just like part of the game. Like I'm playing a card game. I have and it's a game where you can make multiple moves like you, you, you play a card, you can move a card, you can move another card. And it's also a game where if you miss something, you could lose and it could be obvious. So your opponent's just waiting for that knock to go. Ha! You missed this move. So like totally like just automatically. I'm like the the and like Deanna was doing it as well, probably because I was doing it. But it was just like it was like a built in reflex. And yeah, I, I would say. Um, and another example is we used to play another game and we, we have an inside joke, which I don't know if we mentioned on the show before, but, but pass the carrot where we used to pass a, a something physical to players to show whose turn it is. So they wouldn't forget, um, which again, I, the, the joke was, it was my, one of my birthdays at the Knights of Columbus. And it was a game of 31 with like, I don't know, 18 players. And there was a carrot we were passing around and I ate the carrot because, you know, I was distracted <laughs> and then we lost it. So the, now the rule is don't eat the carrot. So that's that's the reminder of keeping track of whose turn it is. All right. Roger brings up uh, if you're if you're not going to finish that game, you can tell people, hurry up, make your mistakes before we restart. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. No, the, 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 again, communication's big. Um, do we have anything else from the chat before I get to a... I think that hits all the big I, points That there. hits most of them. We do appreciate everything you said, even if we don't call it out. We will be jumping into the lobby. Maybe we'll chat a bit more. Um, so in summary, realize the game pacing isn't the same as game length. You can have a long game that goes that, that, that flows well. I guess pacing and flow are kind of similar in a way. I, I hadn't really brought it up before. And you can have a slow game that just, man, it takes too, way too long to get to your turn. A Yahtzee with some players I've had, or even Uno. I have played a game of Uno where someone was taking way too long to figure out what card to play. Different people are going to prefer different pacing, and that's not a bad thing. The important thing is to discuss it before you start playing and make sure everyone's on the same page. Then, once the game starts, do your part to maintain the pace that was discussed. And don't be afraid to communicate while playing. If someone's taking too long or if you need more time or if you need to speed things up, all of that are things that is perfectly cool to talk about. The social contract of the game, unless you're in some kind of tournament space, is not we must all sit in silence and play the game until it's done. All right. Well, that's it for our discussion on board game pacing. Thanks again for the question, Roger. Now, what are your thoughts on game pacing? What's your favorite pace? Let us know in the comments below. Now, if you've got a topic you'd like us to cover, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question, just something you want to hear us discuss. You can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop, or you can email your question to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just remember, we have discussed Minotaur Milk on the show yes, in the past. Yes, we have. 